Welcome to the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel Center for Jewish Education at Brandeis University. We are delighted to welcome you today to this discussion, celebrating the publication of the pathbreaking book, Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning, Making Meaning at Many Tables. This is a research project of the Mandel Center, led and directed by Diane Tickton Schuster. I'm Miriam Heller Stern. I'm a senior fellow at the Mandel Center and I'm one of the chapter authors. And I'm delighted to be moderating our discussion today. A few logistics before we get started. The conversation is being recorded and it will be available on the Mandel Center's website in a few days. Please use the Q&A button to post questions. While we most certainly will not be able to have time for a full Q&A period, we know that we are interested in hearing what you have to say and generating conversation for the future. At the end, you will be asked to share some ideas about future portraits, so stay tuned for that. Today's discussion is really about sowing a field, and you are our partners in cultivating that field. If you've ever attended a class where you've held a Jewish book or a source sheet, or you've prepared a topic that you hold dear to teach to new or familiar audiences. Maybe you've attended a Jewish play or a museum, you've led a Parsha club or a parenting class, you've participated in board trainings, leadership fellowships, professional development programs, taken organized tours. All of the above, you know that Jewish adult learning happens in a wide variety of settings, exploring an endless menu of content and is led by an incredibly eclectic and vast set of teachers. And all of these settings have a broad array of aspirations for learning, growth, understanding, seeking, connecting, and living a life of purpose. Many have asked, is there a secret sauce to how we conduct good or effective adult Jewish learning? And we have not had an organized body of research to guide us until now. The Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning Project conceived and led by Diane Tickton Schuster, its project director and editor, allows us to step inside the experiences of adult Jewish learners. When we read this book, we begin to unpack how teaching and learning happens in lots of places. And we can begin to imagine the possibilities that we might build in the future. I can tell you as a contributor to this work, this project has been very generative from the beginning. Project authors have shared their observations. We've developed conceptual frameworks together. We've made our research generalizable. And we've been able to offer some guiding principles for this burgeoning field. And so the result of this project is this incredible book. I can't wait for all of you to read it if you haven't yet. And the book is as a result, not a how-to handbook, but a how might we Bible. It's a commentary and it generates more interpretation, teaching and hopefully wonder and will spark your curiosity and your experimentation. So our aspiration for this hour is that the discussion will invite you to participate more deeply in this field and to develop the theory and practice of adult Jewish learning with us. Now, for me as a researcher, a Jewish education advocate, and a professional who prepares people to create learning programs for people across the lifespan. In the words of Parker Palmer, I'm a teacher of heart at heart. And so diving into the secrets and mysteries of teaching and learning is a favorite activity of mine. And I'm happy to be here doing that with you. I'm excited that today we have a very large registration for this event with researchers, practitioners, funders, uh, and adult learning enthusiasts of many stripes. So welcome to all of you and welcome to this celebration and exploration of contributions of 12 authors led by our wonderful editor and project leader, Diane Schuster, who we'll turn to in just a moment. First, I wanna introduce our three esteemed colleagues who are joining us as panelists today. Uh, they're gonna to comment on the findings and implications of the book. And we'll begin with, uh, we have with us Miriam Rader Roth, Professor of Education Studies and Educational Community-Based Action Research at the University of Cincinnati. And she's also director of MTEI, the Mandel Teacher Educator Institute. 
Rabbi Josh Fagelson, President and CEO of the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, and Shira Epstein, Dean of the Davidson School of Education at JTS. I'm going to invite each of them to briefly introduce themselves as readers of this book, starting with Miriam Rader Roth. Thanks, Miriam. I'm so delighted to be here to um, talk about this wonderful volume. Um, so I'm a reader of this book as um, somebody who works closely with instructional pedagogical leaders and, who are adults and who are thinking carefully about how to improve the field of Jewish education through their teaching. And so how we create transformative professional development for these adult learners is of central concern to me. And I've learned a great deal um, from the book in that regard. Great, thank you. Josh. Hi, uh, so glad to be here and delighted and see a lot of friends and uh, colleagues uh, uh, who are joining us today. So thank you. Um, I'm here, uh, my, my relationship with this book, I think is both as an educator myself who works with uh, many adults and uh, through much of my career with young adults uh, on, on campuses, um, but also now at, at the Institute of Jewish Spirituality, where uh, we work with all forms of different kinds of adults. Uh, some of them are clergy, some of them are uh, lay people, some of them are, uh, a lot of them are older, and some of them increasingly, a growing proportion are younger. Um, and, and we've also learned so much through, historically, through our retreat work and now learning about how people are creating community online and virtually. So there's a lot of perspectives that um, I found myself just lighting up as I was reading the book and anxious to discuss with all of you. Thank you, Shira. Hi, thank you, Miriam. As you know, I'm really excited to talk about this book. Um, as the Dean of the Davidson School at JTS, our students in our MA and EDD programs and our instructional leadership programs, such as DSLTI and the Day School Standards and Benchmarks Project, are all adult Jewish learners, and they're training to be Jewish educators. So those are my learners I work with, and all educators know, we all know on this Zoom, that we're always modeling with our training and the range of pedagogies we want with our educators to employ with their own learners, whether they're toddlers or adults and all in between, um, I think this book in its brilliance illustrates the range of pedagogies that we can and should be modeling for Jewish educators. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm excited to bring all of your voices into the conversation in just a few minutes. Uh, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diane Tickton schuster Almost 20 years ago, she published Jewish Lives, Jewish Learning, Adult Jewish Learning in Theory and Practice. It's an exploration of the developmental yearnings of Jewish adults and their learning journeys explained through the conceptual research on adult learning and adult development. She's a developmental psychologist who's taught in the schools of education at Hebrew Union College and American Jewish University. And I would describe her as the godmother of the field of research in adult Jewish learning. She has been asking important probing questions to expand the possibilities of where, when, and who participates in Jewish learning, and most importantly, why, toward what aspirations. So Diane, I'd like to invite you to begin our discussion by sharing a bit about the genesis of the Portraits of Adult Jewish Learning Project and this book in particular. Thank you, Miriam. I'm, of course, thrilled to be here today with you and the over 170 people who registered for this exciting book launch. I want to thank the Mandel Center, whose leadership and staff have supported my work for the past six years, and particularly Mandel Center Director John Levison, who has championed the idea of using portraits to spark crucial and critical conversation about Jewish education. John has consistently encouraged me to go wide and deep in this exciting new area of scholarship. I also want to thank my 12 colleagues whose hard work as portrait, portrait writers have brought us to this very special occasion, this Shehekianu moment. 
to today's panelists who have gotten inside the book and agreed to share insights with you, with us. Thank us. Thank you very much. And I also want to acknowledge Wiffenstock Publishers, a relatively new publishing company in Eugene, Oregon, that welcomed both this book and its forerunner, which was called Portraits of Adult, uh, Portraits of Jewish Learning without the adult there. Um, viewing contemporary Jewish education close in. This book was published in 2019, and it's a collection of stories of Jewish children and teens as learners. Wiffenstock consistently has made every effort to get these works into print in a timely manner. The uh, link for Wiffenstock it will be in the chat and you can see more about both of these books and ordering them there. I'd like to talk a little bit about the genesis of this book. As I already mentioned, the earlier portraits book depicted Jewish children and teens as learners, not as not adults, which was kind of ironic because as you've heard from Miriam that's been my passion for at least the last 25 years. However, when I recruited uh, portraits for the first project, I actually received very few proposals focusing on the Jewish adult experience. So in 2019, when John Levison asked if I could organize a second portraits project about adults, I actually wasn't sure. Even though I'd been writing about adult Jewish learning, the reality is that not a lot of research about the experience has been published. Funding, unfortunately, for in-depth studies of learners, teachers, adult learners, teachers, curricula, pedagogies, programs simply hasn't been available. Nevertheless, at John's suggestion, I called about 25 people associated with various adult learning, Jewish learning initiatives to ask if their programs had collected data about their learners and whether they and their colleagues might be interested in writing about the learner's experiences for a broad general readership. As um, Miriam mentioned, this work is intended for educators and rabbis and program planners, board members, adult learning committees, online, online platform managers, funders, and the learners themselves, just like everyone who's on this, web, on this webinar today. In my calls, I also asked if these, or, if these organizations were interested in participating in deep conversations about what we mean when we say adult Jewish learning. I wondered if they would be willing to share with others what their organizations had learned about creating and sustaining adult Jewish learning programs. Would they be open across their organizations to talk about their strategies and challenges and even their secret sauce, sauces for success. When, while I heard a lot of interest expressed in those calls, the new project, this new project didn't really gel until I began talking to colleagues who were in what might be called the unexpected places or spaces of Jewish education. These were people who saw adult Jewish learning take place, taking place well beyond the Beit Midrash where with learners huddled around a text or a synagogue or JCC where audiences learn from lectures by experts. These researchers and practitioners understood that adult Jewish learning in the 21st century needs to be conceptualized and contextualized in different ways than before. And on the screen, you see who the portraits of a Jewish, Jewish learning Pagel fellows are, the authors, and then the focus of the portraits that they proposed. These are my 12 wonderful colleagues. These fellows came from a range, wide range of settings, and they represented the huge diversity of people who now sit at or walk around in or log onto the wide range of places and spaces where Jewish learning now takes place. These authors were attracted to the opportunity to articulate what goes on inside today's Jewish learning settings. They were intrigued with the methodology of portraiture as a way to help the Jewish community think about, think in new ways about the field. And they, and I hoped, 
and continue to hope that the portraits will spark serious conversation about this vibrant dimension of Jewish education. So Diane, now that you've introduced us to the project, can you tell us a little bit more about portraiture uh, as a methodology? How has portraiture afforded us uh, the opportunity to open up a really rich conversation about how practice can change in adult Jewish learning and specifically with an eye toward 21st century learners and learning? So as a starting point, it's important to explain what portraiture actually is as a social science methodology. Unlike evaluation research, which often is a hallmark of, of program development or studies of large groups, and we have no studies of large groups in, in adult Jewish education, portraits focus on the details and dynamics of what's happening in a learning situation. Portraitists, if we give them a, a, a label, do a lot of observing but they also may interview the people involved or analyze videos or study curricular materials and other documents and so on. They describe their research findings in, a, in such a way that we can get inside the learning experience and see it from the participants point of view. We are helped to see what facilitates learning and also what obstacles may need to be overcome. Portraits are crafted to real, reveal more about the process of learning than about learning outcomes or the mastery of material or even best practices. Like video footage, they help us to get a sense of the atmosphere. We hear the voices and interactions. Um, we pick up nuances and we unpack the dynamics of learning. Portraitists are not neutral observers. As seasoned professionals in Jewish education, the Pagel Fellows brought their own understanding of what they were seeing. And they are well, were well positioned to challenge the tendency to think of Jewish, adult Jewish learning as a one size fits all approach. What stood out in the Pagel Fellows earliest discussions was an awareness that there's no single model of adult Jewish learning. Their research revealed the huge diversity in who the learners are, what they want and need to learn, where their learning occurs, and how the content is transmitted or appreciated or applied or all of the above. Taken together, the portraits challenge us to think about the scope and purposes of adult Jewish learning. They push us to learn from examples that don't fit quite fit with, within whatever frames we typically have used, and they invite us to move outside of our old frames. They help us to think in new ways about we, how we might plan and design and more pre precisely evaluate adult Jewish learning activities. And by taking us inside the adult Jewish learning experience, the portraits can help us to be more informed as we make decisions and policies for our programs and the field overall. One big takeaway, and I'll have another thought about takeaways later, but one big takeaway for me is that the work of rethinking the field, of expanding the field, might begin with our getting even more portraits. I see these eight accounts as rich, rich texts for learning about adult Jewish learners, texts for studying adult Jewish learning. We need to, to closely unpack these examples and we need more of them. So I hope later or during the, the webinar, those of you in the audience who have ideas for other part portraits that should be written, list them in the chat. And as you listen to the panel, see what new ideas are sparked within you for portraiture and more conversation. Thank you for the invitation, Diane. You know, it's it's so refreshing to be in a conversation with a researcher who isn't just interested in their own ideas, but is constantly inviting other people to explore and share theirs. And you've certainly shep shepherded so many 
practitioners into the practice of research into studying their own practice. And there's so much that we can learn because so many of us have benefited from your wisdom and your guidance. So let's turn the conversation. Uh, let's go a little broad as well as deep. Dan, you've invited readers to look beyond the frame in this book. And uh, our panelists have a lot to say. So we've agreed to structure our conversation around some key motifs in the narratives. Each story is rich and compelling in its detail. And we also want to kind of zoom up and down and look at some of the ways that these different portraits elucidate our understanding of what the field is and can be. Specifically, who, what, where, how, and toward what aspirations. So one of the issues that this book raises is questions about Jewish literacy and literacies and ideas about what adult jo Jews know, should know, want to know. Uh, Shira, would you start us off and share a little bit about how this book expands our understanding of Jewish literacy and literacies? Yes, it's my pleasure. So I read the portraits in this book with the backdrop throughout of my own earliest research, which was on preteens and biblical texts and using drama pedagogy. And I utilized a social literacies frame, which at the time was is gaining more traction in the Jewish world. I, I would imagine a lot of people on this uh, Zoom already grab onto it without maybe using the formal language. But um, one of the many reasons I love this book is that each chapter is an amplification in my mind of social literacy approach. So as opposed to, say, a functional literacy approach, where literacy is an end state. We achieve through having more knowledge. However, that's defined. It's a gathering of discrete facts. So we think back to E.D. Hirsch and cultural literacy or um, Talishkin's book, Jewish Literacy, which was long list, things to memorize, things to know. Um, social literacy is a process. It's, a me it's mediated via interactions. Literacy is built in this frame via engagement with our world and with others. So it's a social process of meaning making and this meaning. So we are from the very youngest age to the oldest age at home, in schools, on the playgrounds, in the grocery store, engaged in literacy events. So in the social literacy frame, literacy events, for example, as in uh, Laura's chapter uh, in the museum at the National Museum of American Jewish History, the literacy event is a museum event um, and a date activity, which I loved reading about having lots of many dates in New York City um, at museums. So within a social <laughs> literacy frame, we examine the literacy practices of that event. So it takes us outside of discrete facts and knowledge. So as Laura did, looking closely at the couples on, uh, that she analyzed, engagement with, for example, that wagon, I love that, um, in the colonial era American history exhibit. So how they talked about that, what's the literacy practices within this larger event. So Laura captures how the couple connects with the wagon um, and really engages with intertextuality, right? connecting it to prior understandings of what Jewish engagement in colonial history was or wasn't saying, oh, wow, or I didn't know that. So that is social literacy. And I think that weaves throughout the book, um, the portrait of adult Jewish learning um, chapters make visible, lift up, amplify what a bystander might think. For example, a museum might just be date banter um, it is a Jewish literacy practice within this frame, a chavruta practice. So um, as we'll explore further, I'm sure I, the book throughout amplifies often unseen invisible literacy events and practices and holds them up as adult Jewish learning. And perhaps those invisible events are incredibly significant because those are the moments where people are making meaning of what they're encountering, what they're experiencing. That's where the thinking is happening. Yeah, I would, I, in my mind, yes. So I'm curious, you know, 
Josh and Miriam, what it brought up for you. Definitely in terms of the the, the literacy question, we're, if we're, we're, we're staying there. Um, uh, I, I was also really drawn, shared by Laura's portrait and the museum. But I'm also thinking about, you know, there was um, the uh, the portrait um, Lauren Applebaum's about um, uh, early childhood educators in this trip to Israel, right? And um, the different, and, and what's fascinating to me about that is also the sort of um, boundary, right, that's drawn between, on the one hand, these are adult Jewish learners who are doing it on behalf of um, young children. Right. And so and and how there's a bit of there is clearly like a boundary crossing piece there, which I'll get to. We'll, we'll get to in a few minutes, I think, about like who who are the, you know, what does this tell us about adult Jewish learners? But um, it was grabbing onto um, other forms of literacy as well. Again, I mean, there, there, there's clearly I see this book as part of a larger sort of corrective um you know of expanding our notions of literacy um definitely beyond strictly you know the textual uh you know te textual literacy um and uh and i think that that's just sort of every virtually every example even the ones that are heavily centered on text i think ultimately the stories um you know i think joshua Layden's um uh piece i think jane shapiro's piece which are both very centered on text and yet the portraiture element diane allows it to sort of breathe more and allows us to to look at what are some of the social and relational literacies you know and this larger project of um th there's actually there's a line in the chapter on Aboda um which is Sarah Alpert and uh, Abigail Ehrman's um chapter about young adults right and it draws on uh, literature I'm very familiar with of Sharon Parks and others a young adult theory but that young adults or emerging adults um, looking for coherence and meaning and basically feeling creating a sense of home and I I was really struck that you know we might think about literacy as the capacity as, to feel at home mm. right in uh in 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 Jewish life right uh to me that would be sort of a corollary of what I've developed as a definition of spirituality as being the capacity to feel at home in the universe but let's say that literacy is like the ability to feel at home in Jewish life both textually socially traditionally ritually whatever you know um it's a feeling of am I other am I alien or am I at home here so absolutely every every portrait here is is contributing to that yeah, and I think, um, Bill, you know, Shira, I love that you got us off on, by thinking about this social literacy and, you know, and, and thinking about the social literacies, like the plurality of when we look at this book as um, a mosaic or as an exhibit, right, of portraits. Um, and we'll talk a bit about the spaces uh, in a minute, but um, that the very nature of what do we mean by Jewish literacy is questioned in this book um, for adults. And what kinds of knowledges do we need to be creating opportunities for constructing in 2022 in this do domain? And so when we look at the question about Jewish pluralism in Yaffa Epstein and Tali Zelkowitz's chapter, hand in hand with looking at the chapter on Avoda, right? Hand in hand with the literacies of early childhood educators. And then actors in Miriam, your chapter together with Tobin Belzer. And those are all in some ways radically different literacies, all with the focal purpose of constructing meaning in these people's lives at different developmental spectrum. And so that is one of the like, gems of this book is that in one volume we can see those and through the mode of portraiture really see those um literacies enacted so it's one of the many beautiful things about this about this book i'd also like to point out uh, building on that that the chapter about latinx jews and their literacy needs or what it what from what Josh was saying about feeling at home in Jewish life. And I th think that what Lourdes Arguez and Anne Rivero have brought to uh, us to really reconsider 
what we mean by literacy for a very different population than we're used to encountering. Uh, I'm appreciating the juxtaposition here of thinking about um, home and as both an idea, a concept, a state of being, uh, as well as an actual place, um, and the relationship between home and social literacy, uh, that all of this uh, thinking about adult Jewish learning happens in relationship, feeds relationships. And um, while the idea of home or uh, social interactions that make us feel good might suggest that what we're looking for is comfort and positivity and kind of, you know, a sense of happiness. Uh, there's a way in which a lot of these portraits show us how our learners wrestle with the complexity of real life that they are encountering and how these Jewish contexts for learning, different as they may be, each help those learners make sense of the world that they're living in, both in the joy and in the oy, as we sometimes say in our community. And so as we think about those different learners and their sense making, this book really opens up for us our image of who the learners are. Uh, and a conventional image of adult Jewish learning, might one might imagine a group of congregants at a synagogue sitting around a table, and certainly that's an important space where people should gather for Jewish learning. But we see a lot of different kinds of learners in different life stages of, from emerging adulthood throughout the lifespan. So Josh, I know you wanna to talk to us a little bit about how this book helps us rethink who are the learners? Uh, who are these adults, these Jews, these learners, and how do we parse that out? Yeah, thank you, Miriam. And, and I've actually, I got the book in front of me and I just, I, I opened up to the table of contents just so I can like, I think it's helpful for people who haven't looked at it or haven't read it like I've had the benefit of having this in my hands for a while but just to like give you a sense of the of the breadth of this um so we lead off with <laughs> we lead off with as as, as Shira uh said um a couple of couples uh who are uh you know, I think representative um in some ways of like what romantic couples could look like today um and uh and and where very importantly, not everybody in those uh, in in those two couples is Jewish, right? And has relationships with, the, I think, the presence of people who are not Jewish in Jewish uh, learning spaces is one of the most important contributions to expanding what do we mean? Who are the learners that we're talking about? So Laura's um, piece starts off with that. We have Miriam and Tobin's uh, piece that brings us into artists. Um, uh, I see Aaron is on the call today, you know, through uh, theater Dybbuk making making new artwork and how they are making new theater. And again, you know, this is not, we might have thought of that as like artistic creation before, but seeing that now as adult Jewish learning, right, um, through a very different sort of uh, approach than the synagogue library with a book in front of you. Um, we have activists in, uh, in Avodah, young um, young adults, right, who are in a, a communal living environment and an intentional space and sort of discovering themselves and uh, in, a, in an essay entitled Productive Discomfort by Sarah Albert and Abigail Ehrman. Um, we have the, uh, uh, the early childhood educators that I mentioned. We have one of the most interesting to me is Joshua Layden's essay about working at a, a JCC, teaching, uh, teaching the staff at a Jewish agency uh, in the Bay Area where um, and he's teaching text and it looks, you know, from that vantage point, it looks like, oh, that's sort of a classical sort of look. But the people who are in the room, right, include clerical staff, include custodial staff, include all sorts of interesting folks who, again, might not be in a in a con conventional portrait, right? And it's really expanding our lens of thinking not all these folks are Jewish, not all these folks certainly are Jewish educators. Some folks, some people might be Jewish, but like that's not a main part of their job. They're a social worker and that, that's not who they work with. So how does that come into, um, how does that inform their work um, and how does that inform their own identity? 
And we've mentioned the Latinx community, which is one of the most fascinating essays in here. We have Jane Shapiro, uh, my friend's um, uh, essay about um, may maybe one that looks may may might look the most familiar, a group of, uh, of learners who have been together for a long time, who started in Melton and who then evolved, but who uh, are a group of women and who are uh, already that's still a revolutionary, you know, change from the portrait, the standard one, um, and who have been together for a long time and the long termness of those relationships. And then we and then we have Yafa and Tali's uh, essay about um, Wexner Heritage Program participants um, and, you know, and, and building these these uh, muscles of pluralism in midlife, right, in their in people in their you know, 30s, 40s. Um, and so I, I think, and, and then there's Diane's closing essay as well. So all of these things you know, sort of stretch our um, notions, at least they did for me, and I think that's reflected in the blurb that I gave on the back of the book, right? Stretch the notion of, oh, when you first think of adult Jewish learning, who's in the room and what is the, you know, what does it look like? Um, these just invite such a larger uh, conception. I think there's also a really interesting question that comes to my mind, and, it, and I guess, Diane, it really works well with your previous book, uh, with the Portraits of Jewish Learning book, which is, it sort of invites a question, what is the adult, what do we mean by the word adult, and how does inserting the word adult illuminate both the adult experience, but also um, the younger than adult experience, right? Or I think this came up when the, the, the five of us were talking a few weeks ago, um, those of us who have uh, uh, spouses or parents who we're caring for, who, um, when we posit adult as meaning making, right, or as some sort of like a very cognitive enterprise, what happens when we're um, in relationship with and people and adults who are no longer their 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 brains aren't working that way anymore, right? And what does that tell us about? adult Jewish learning. Um, I, I found myself just really intrigued by those questions that working at those margins, this, uh, th that was where my, my, my mind was, um, was also going. The last thing I would just also say is um, another way of talking about the diversity of who's here is that there's, what's so helpful is the spirit in which these essays are each written is there's no presumption of what people's loyalties, attachments, um, prior experiences are. Um, and I think that itself is a really, really important orientation for any of us who are working in the field um, to try to sort of approach, as I would say in our, our work like with Beginner's Mind, is um, to have a very charitable view of who we're looking at um, and not have some prior agenda of what they should look like or what they should know or judge them about this, that, or the other. There's a real openness and um, uh, and, and, and charity, generosity, that's the word I'm looking for, generosity about the flavor of these essays. Uh, Josh, uh, thank you for, for all that. And really, I think it's so important to highlight all of the chapters. And I hope people will now who haven't read the book pick up and read it and see the array of adult Jewish learners. I want to latch on to just one thing that you pointed out and, and um, how you started off earlier. Um, the Jewish early childhood educators discovering Israel, um, a very protected space to play, um, Lauren Applebaum's chapter um connecting to what you what you ended with around who are adult Jewish learners. Um, Many of you who are on this call know I'm, I'm always trying to add my voice to be an advocate for early childhood educators who are often seen as, um, you know, lower status, um, lower level, maybe not even seen in their fullness as adult Jewish learners because of the population that they work with. And what I most appreciated about this chapter was the way it's taking early childhood educators seriously as learners, as professionals, and engaging with complex knowledge building. So again, returning this social literacy frame, um, illuminating play-based learning for adults as serious learning. So I loved the way in which um, they're on a shook visit to Machana Yehuda on their trip to Israel, and how that is adult 
Jewish learning. The, again, the literacy practices of they were given a map and having to order food. So they're practicing using their Hebrew and engaging with Israeli culture. Um, and so where that might be invisible, this book lifts up um, as an example of who our adult Jewish learners are. Um, that in our families that it takes place, we're thinking about Rosh Hashanah coming up, going to a green market with our kids and, and buying apples and honey, that is a literacy practice. So um, I'll always and forever be a voice for early childhood educators as serious adult Jewish learners. You know, one one piece I'd like to add to this, and this comes from um, Lourdes and Anna's um, portrait of emerging Jewish world about the Latinx community in California. Um, and it really caused a question, in, is are we paying enough attention in our diverse Jewish worlds to who our, who our learners are? Who is hiding? Who aren't we seeing? Um, and this um, essay in particular kind of is a wake up call to people who are being quiet because they have to be in order to protect their own spaces. And how do we as a Jewish world create protected spaces for people who are living on the margins. And so I think, um, and then another interesting really dimension from this, from that chapter is what histories are people bringing and histories that they're finding out through, you know, genetic testing, not necessarily the family past stories or family past stories that are coming out on elders' deathbeds. Right. Mm -hmm. So not our traditional mode of transmission, shall we say. Um, and how are we really thinking about inclusion in the broadest sense of the world in North America for the for the for the moment where this uh, this set of essays really focus so that. You know, who are they and where are they and how are we creating spaces? for them to come to the table. I think we're also seeing the opportunity here for people to create to create their own or co-create within existing institutions. When we talk about inclusion, often the critique is that there's an expectation that people have to come in and join and yeah. be kind of just become part of what is. And we're seeing learning processes unfold where the learners themselves are actually creating, constructing along with the, uh, the facilitators, the teachers, the leaders. And so it's really a dynamic process of creation together that is um, a result of the learning or it, it's, it's an unintended or, or hopefully intended outcome. It's an emergent outcome, if not the intended outcome. Diane. Yes. Miriam, I think that really emerges in, or is seen in, in the chapter about Theodor Dybbuk and the, the collaborative production of knowledge that comes from within the group and what people bring. And just going back to Josh's tease about what is the difference, what, what are adults? Um, it, you know, good learning is good learning. Good practice, good education is good education. What we know though, is adults bring, adults are voluntary as learners. They can walk, whereas kids are required to stay um, and don't have as much control over what they're, hopefully they have more control over what they learn, but they're often told this is what you need to learn. Whereas adults are voluntary. They also take, tend to take more responsibility for follow through that is part of the difference between an, ad an adolescent and an adult you know at the end of the day you're responsible when you're an adult and with that that combination of volunteerism for learning and responsibility taking what we get is a, a different energy level a, often a, a willingness to struggle certainly in the Avodah chapter and in the the, the um, Wexner heritage chapter there's a lot of struggle that goes on to come to terms with Jewish identity, Jewish uh, red lines, where, you know, what I'll accept and what I might not accept. And all of that, uh, that 
productive discomfort, that struggle um, is a healthy part of adult learning and can lead to significant change. People do change, they do grow, and we need to support them in those um, endeavors. So Diane, you raise an important point that frames uh, where we wanted to go next in the conversation, which is how do we create learning environments where that struggle can happen and be productive and uh, be a space for healthy and authentic learning? And Miriam, I know you do a lot of uh, thinking about how we create holding environments for learning. And can you tell us a little bit about that and comment on some of the holding environments that are described in this book? Sure. So just a word about what a holding environment is, which the notion which comes out of the infancy literature originally from Winnicott, but then Bob Keegan in his work on adult development talked about holding environments for adults as um, places where that are evolutionary bridges and where there's an ingenious blend of challenge and support. And um, and I'll just say that um, Lauren Applebaum in her chapter is challenging Keegan a little bit to say, and they need to be protected spaces to play. And I think that's an absolute, that's absolutely accurate, like an important addition to that. Um, and, um, and so where are these holding environments taking place in this book? So um, when you think about the spaces, we've got federation boardrooms, we have the Zoom boxes that we're sitting in today, an apartment in Tel Aviv rich with art supplies, an apartment in LA with Trader Joe's snacks and stories uh, based in the biblical stories, um, a bite with pro protest posters and eclectic bookshelves that show that the history of the different residents in this bite, parking lots outside of a synagogue where people hang out and talk because that's a space that's available to them. Bus rides in Israel, a museum gallery in Philadelphia, a tech study space in Skokie. So within these spaces, intentional community is created. And one of the things I think this book does really beautifully and asks a really important question is, What's the interplay between the learning of the individual and the learning of the community? And the dynamics of the community itself creates powerful and effervescent opportunities for learning. So, but one of the things that this book does, I think really well, is that these lessons about the relational context of teaching and learning, which is a place I spend a lot of time thinking about, they're not at all two dimensional, they're fully rendered. And they're also attentive to the time in life and the lived experiences of the learners. So we've got people in their early 20s in Avoda. We have seasoned early childhood educators. We have a group of learners in Jane Shapiro's chapter that have been studying together for more than a decade. And in these, in these, all of these spaces, we have this productive discomfort and we have a, the relief of play. And so I think one of the things that this raises for us is to think about how do you decide which group needs which kind of space? And the, that what Keegan talks about, that ingenious blend of challenge and support. So for people like us who are teaching adults, how do we know? Where is that ingenious blend? It's, there's no recipe book, right? So Miriam, going back to your comment at the early, uh, uh, about the nature of this book of a how, white, how might we handbook? I think that's really a very apt description of um, what this volume does. So when I think about the theater Dybbuk work and the work with a text, finding their voices through the voices of the actors. There we have such a beautiful um, description of the interplay of the individual working on their voice within a theater company. 
So I'll pause there. I have more to say about this, but I'll pause there for a sec. Miriam, I, um, there's so much in what you say. If we had more time, I would respond to. But I wanted to latch on to the phrase you used early on of intentional community, mm -hmm. um, because if this question of how and the spaces for learning, um, I, uh, several people have already referenced uh, Sarah Alberts and Abby Ehrman's um, chapter on productive discomfort in Avodah as a learning environment for emerging Jewish adults. Um, so I was thinking a lot when I was reading this uh, chapter about community, and I think that shows up throughout the book, um, how we are intentional about building that. And then what is the challenge? As some of you already said, Miriam, uh, Heller Stern, you said, right, we, we like to amplify now in Jewish education that everything is joyful and should be beautiful. But what's so great and rich about this chapter is that it, it acknowledges that sometimes the learning comes from that productive discomfort. Um, I was thinking a lot about, you know, I teach here at Davidson about multicultural pedagogies um, a, as an approach. So the multicultural pedagogy of approach to learning is how we engage a wide range of learners through a wide range of pedagogies, listening to one another, holding silences, disagreeing with each other, and having very difficult conversations. And so that came up for me as I was reading this chapter of, you know, here with Avodah um, in the Jewish Service Corps, learn how to hold that discomfort and engage with it in a way that propels them forward. Um, that's a very challenging thing to do. It's probably why many of us often don't go to that place because it is hard but um that I, I i think that's throughout the book talking about well where are those discomforts in learning and how does that happen when it's not just us sitting with a book alone that is a very real way of learning i don't want people to think i'm saying that can't be a way of learning right. that's often an important way of learning um but that also in these places of community that's where these challenges arise and that's where opportunity arises too I think something else that comes up is, um, uh, you know, um, Casper Turkile and others have talked recently, a lot recently about like unbundling, right? Uh, the, the unbundling and repackaging um, of everything in, in, in our lives. And I think you, uh, this also gives a sense of that, right? Of, of, and perhaps adult Jewish learning has always kind of been, you know, that way, but like, it's really like thrusting it into higher relief. I'm thinking about like all the different sites Right. Um, I, I remember when I, I, you know, I, I read Casper had an article a couple of years ago in the New York Times about, you know, the spiritual practice at work and work as the site of ritual. And I forwarded it to our board chair saying, like, once I got over the little bit of throw up in my mouth, I realized there was something really awesome here. Right. Like very, very worth taking seriously. But I think that um, <laughs> I've told Casper that. So it's not, I'm not saying anything out of school, but um but I think that there's something really here about all these different, you know, sites and with the expansion of who's in the room. So, you know, yes, the workplace, but it's not just, you know, Jewish learning at the workplace for the Jews or for the Jewish educators. Um, it's for everybody. And like, what does that do? Right. Or what does it do? Obviously, like in an apartment for, you know, a group of, of, of theater artists as they're creating. There's all these ways that it, that, that that it expands us. You know, one thing that came up to me, I remember writing in the margins, we got some a bit of online community because of the pandemic here. But I was like, Miriam Anzavin, like, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking, what about like those kind of, you know, adult Jewish learning communities? Um, of course, because the online space is not just where the kids hang out, right? And so I'm wondering about that too. Like, you know, what we're starting to see in some of the, the Q&A, like, you know, thoughts about where to take this. And like, that's one that like, I think is really interesting to me um, among others. So, but it, th this already does such an, a wonderful job of expanding our horizons about where this is all taking place. Yeah, as I'm listening to you, the, um, the, the comments about space and learners and literacies raise uh, an important set of questions for the role of the adult Jewish educator. Um, one might think of that role as simply preparing the content, right? Preparing a source sheet and curating it, uh, you know, with knowledge and wisdom and style and thinking about all the things we want to cover and the way we want to illuminate a subject. Uh, but when we think of our role also as how do we create norms and a culture 
where people can be seekers, uh, where people can wrestle without getting in each other's way. Uh, we all know the adult learners who have fled spaces because they didn't like, you know, what Harriet said or what Joe always says. And so we have to think about the group. Uh, and uh, there was a question in the chat about Hebrew and Hebrew literacy. You know, how do we adjust? Uh, how do we use both insider language, but also make sure that we are working in translation and doing it in ways that are authentic so people can have an immersive experience linguistically, but also have an accessible experience. Linguistically, uh, linguistically. Before I before I turn this back to Diane for some general reflections and comment, Miriam, I think you said you had something else you wanted to say on this topic, and I wanted to make sure to hand the mic back to you. Yeah, thanks. You know, one the word space does um, thread in this beautiful way through the volume and different conceptual like third space and in between space, but um, those spaces and the interplay between the individual it's really so much how identity is shaped both internally and within the so this jewishness the queerness the whiteness the um and and the and the tensions that that holds um jane shapiro it has a in her portrait has a moment where one person's moment of what she describes as flow creates this deep intellectual and spiritual connection for all. And so that sense, again, I think of space where the community with all of the tensions that, you know, I think in Zelkowitz and um, Epstein's piece, they talk about confidence and vulnerability, challenge and acceptance, empowerment and humility. All of that happens in this incredible space that's created by these communities and then there are these individual beautiful humans who are working through the deepest and most complex identity issues. And I think that it's just painted in these beautiful strokes here. Dan, I wanna invite you to share some thoughts for a few minutes. And uh, the I apologize that we had been generically using the term chat, but the questions are coming through the Q&A. They're visible to the panelists. Uh, Diane, I don't know if you want to weave any of this in or we can get back to them, uh, but there's some wonderful comments to be shared. So I want, I want to, well, thank you all for your deep read of this volume and for the questions that you're raising for all of us. Um, there are two things I want to say um, based on what was important to me about this work, but also some implications for for really strengthening a broader field and I, I thought the first is that if, if you remember i i mentioned that i asked organizations if they would like to talk among with one another and share their experiences experiences and their challenges and their findings and their numbers and so forth in a in a not in a um, show and tell way but in a really authentic deep discourse way and I appreciated that Sarah Alpert and Abby Ehrman uh, were prepared to include in this uh, volume uh, their program outcomes for Avoda, which I think is a unprecedented to see an organization's program outcomes and then to talk about how they go about or what their challenges are with that. I'm thinking also how grateful I was with the uh, portraits of Jewish learning, I'm sorry, with Jewish lives, Jewish learning, the, the early, my earlier book, how the Melton faculty were willing to share their roadmaps, which modeled really useful ways to think about how we construct uh, learning experiences. So I, I just really want to emphasize we need more dis discourse and exchange. It's not happened. Uh, secondly, I, I noticed in the panelists comments, uh, something that was extremely important to me in working with the authors, which was to have them contextualize their findings in theoretical uh, frameworks. And you mentioned frameworks, whether it's Keegan or Palmer or Parks or Csikszentmihalyi, who is the flow person. Um, th th there were, there's no one adult learning framework. So we don't even we didn't even mention transformative learning in this conversation day, which is often where 
adult Jewish learning conversations go. It's much, the theoretical frames are much richer than that. And we need to draw on those uh, resources for thinking about what we're doing. And finally, I, I want to really say that the opportunity is now to help some of our more traditional places like synagogues that have robust adult Jewish learning programs, but maybe or SO federations and other community organizations, which where they really need to think about what they're doing, how to build excellence and help their educators, help the teachers, whether, you know, rabbis get very little preparation for teaching adults. They go into the field often saying, that's what I want to do, but then they, they might take a course or part of a course in education while in, in seminary. So we need to help our educators. We need to help our adult committee, adult learning committees. We need to help the, support the people who are already in place and really um, bring them into a conversation that is centered in their realities and also in the learners' realities. So those are, those are kind of my big passions about this right now. Thank you, Diane. Um, I want to spend a few minutes just giving each panelist a chance to comment on one big insight, big idea, or quest ripe question that you're walking away from this book with in mind. And feel free to chime in in any order. I did not prompt you on an order this time. I can lead off here. Great. Thank you, Miriam. Um, so the big question, and I really found myself thinking about this hard um, this morning is, so if the creation of communal learning spaces where the interplay of the individual and the group is essential to learning, right? I think that's the assumption in the book and beautifully portrayed. And where we have to make decisions about the nature of that interplay. Is it productive discomfort? Is it protected space to play? And we know that's all important. How do we, as leaders or facilitators of such spaces, discern the kind of dynamics of the community that this particular group needs? Mm -hmm. So developmental, relational, identity, all of that, how do, we, um, how do we think about that? And is there an emerging framework from this book that we could build on? Um, and I think this applies to the not to the Philadelphia Museum as much as it applies to schools that are based in congregations and day schools where there are adults who are leading these spaces and who are the adult learners who want, we're hoping to help continue for all of us to grow. So that's my question. Thank you, Miriam. I'll chime in. Um... You know, you, uh, I forgot who alluded to the challenge of funding. I think, Diane, it was you, um, right? Uh, adult Jewish education tends to be the, you know, underfunded, uh, deeply underfunded step, 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 stepchild, right? And um, and I think that, you know, my, my, my guess for why that is, is that uh, in an implicit continuity agenda, even if we're over the continuity agenda, there's still the continuity agenda. Ask anybody who works in fundraising, um, and and so the, the the payoff question is like is right there. It's like great. So you gave a bunch of adults. You helped them find more meaning in their lives. That's great. What does that do for the Jewish future? Right. Like that. That that's sort of the implicit question. And I think that I would love to excavate that question more because I think to those of us who are here. Um, we probably already have some very good, robust answers to that, but really like spelling that out of like why the presence of um, adults, parents, grandparents, and young and, and young people it doesn't even have to be just in relation to people who have progeny, right? But just why the presence of adults who are living fulfilled, engaged Jewish lives is healthy for the Jewish present and future, right? Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's a that that's a sort of um, very ripe ground, I think a case that really needs to be developed for those who are not here, um, you know, who are not already in the room. And so they might come for the continuity, but they'll stay for the um, meaning making, right? So I, I think that there's something there 
um, that we probably, that, that could be a next piece of the agenda. Thank you. So I'll, I'll say that, um, Dan, I'm really glad that you responded. There was a comment um, in the Q&A that I guess um, hurt my heart a little bit that um, someone would, um, is on this Zoom and would think that, you know, there's any sort of disparagement of synagogue based learning. Um, and I'm Dan, I'm really glad you spoke to that. Um, I think the question I'm walking away from this conversation with is how can we elevate all different types of learning? I, I, I imagine the intentionality of focusing the chapters largely on experiential, less formal based learning and not synagogue basis because it's speaking back to that uh, that's often what's most visible as adult Jewish learning, like a very formal sitting around with a piece of text or around Torah or around Talmud, right? So um, how can we hold it all and not privilege one over the other? One say is one more higher status than the other. But again, going back to social literacy, thinking some people have already mm -hmm. said about the context, right? So if we're looking at learners where play-based learning will really be the best way to elevate them, how can we privilege that just as much as it would be sitting with the source sheet, which sometimes is the best way to elevate adult Jewish learning? So how can we make it all visible and all choices? Yeah, and I wanna build on that because I think there's often a rhetoric uh, around moving from the sage on the stage model to the guide on the side as if one is necessarily better than the other. And it's a fallacy in education to try to declare that one is always better. It is possible to create immersive, inspiring, enriching adult Jewish learning spaces that are frontal. And it's also possible to create inspiring, immersive adult Jewish learning spaces that are participatory. And it's not just a matter of pedagogy, it's a matter of intentionality around how do you create the environment where the desired kind of learning can happen. And that's the role of the educator, whether they are teaching in a synagogue or in Whole Foods or in a living room, uh, and whether they're a professional educator or not. I think one of the things that we're seeing threaded through these portraits is the possibility that we can bridge the relational and social with the cognitive, the intellectual, the academic. And there may be learners who have more of a preference that we live in one end of the continuum or the other, but they are not inherently opposed either as pedagogies or as outcomes. And so I hope that what readers will take away from this uh, is looking at a portrait, reading a portrait of a learning space or a group of learners who are different from us. It's just a way of holding up the mirror and asking, are those kinds of learners in my space? Uh, or could I learn something from that teacher in my space and still hold my space authentically, but in a richer way? Uh, I wanna mention one thing that I got out of the project as a contributor. Uh, which was a um, which was part of just the generative nature of being a researcher in this space. Uh, we were asked to uh, to conduct our research, bring our observations. We met periodically. We had these kind of mini conferences that were supposed to be in person, wound up on Zoom because of COVID. Uh, but we presented our findings and we helped each other analyze. You know, when you're really deep inside a study, sometimes it's hard to kind of get up on the balcony and see what's going on. Uh, and I had the privilege of working with Dr. Tobin Belzer, who is my co-author. And when we were trying to make educational sense of what we're seeing in Theodore Debick, there was a point where she said, this sounds like project-based learning for adults. And it was just this moment of like, of course, <laughs> you really get me. But sometimes we can't put the words to it ourselves. And so being in conversation with other people who care about the same endeavors can help us make sense of what we're doing and learn from each other's practice. And that was a big aha moment that was afforded by having a research partner and also being in conversation with the other authors 
in the book. I'd like to build on that because um, about a year and a half ago when the, when the chapters were all works in progress, we had a number of meetings where we presented our papers as, as they were at the time. And we had outside um, resource people to come in and help us think more fully about what was going on. And at, after the, these two uh, wonderful seminars were over, I kept getting messages from the outside readers uh, or the outside uh, resource people. Can we do more of this? Can we have more conversation? I've never been in a conversation like this where we're really talking how we're doing research about a topic, how what the topic really is here. How do we get to the nuances of all of this? And I, this spirit of discourse and exchange was very much the experience, my experience as the project director. This group came together and shared and critiqued and provided resources to one another. And I think we were a model. And I'm seeing this in this conversation today. Here's another such conversation. And I really encourage our larger community to create these conversations to, to look inside what's going on and how what we can do and what might be possible. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I want to very much say, we need more portraits. Uh, eight was wonderful, but that's not, a, that's not a whole field. And you're all living in spaces and working in programs and trying things out and working, uh, being learners yourselves. If there's a portrait idea you have, share it with us now in the in the q a not the chat we've learned that today uh we're learning right um also you know be in touch with with us at brandeis at the mandel center because there is this rich opportunity to not stop but to keep going keep moving forward and building a field that needs create creative minds and lots of lots of perspectives and lots of new ways of thinking about something we're all engaged in and care about and want to become even more vibrant. Thank you, Diane. Uh, we do want to hear from you and we're thinking about the next stages of not just this project, uh, but also thinking about how this book can be a launch pad for further cultivating a field of conversation and research about uh, theory and practice in adult Jewish learning. So if you have ideas for portraits that you would like to see studied and written, please do share them with us uh, in the Q&A. We're collecting them. We're thinking about what happens next. Uh, there is, there's so much richness and there is a lot of expertise gathered today in this audience. And we want to make sure that we harvest uh, what it is that you have to share. Um, I have seen, uh, let's see, there's a comment about parents. I'm sure parenting classes and parent education uh, could be a very rich site for study. Um, there were some comments earlier about synagogues being spaces, both for formal learning, but also for learning to live uh, and uh, for adult education that is elevated and uh, creative. And so I think those are spaces that we want to mine as well. Uh, and we do have a couple of portraits in this book that are about sitting with texts. And I think people are really interested in thinking more about how we sit with texts and what is the role of the expert uh, as both the sage and the guide in those conversations and explorations. I would also say we need we need portraits of adult Jewish educators. You know, um, Sarah Tower, Zikronon Levraha, wrote a book about three rabbis as educators. And that's really it. We have we have a few other things. I recently uh, wrote something about Rachel Korazim as an educator, but we need we need portraits of adult Jewish educators to help um, inspire and challenge our assumptions um, and that's a, a whole other area beside the the, the spaces and the learners um, and then the context we really are without our wonderful teachers who are doing some brilliant creative work 
we are missing an opportunity to really populate our understanding. Great, there's a comment about the Musar Institute and its work that it's doing um, yes. and how we're thinking about peer-led learning and training as yes. well. Uh, right. And so again, all of this, uh, I think Miriam used the, the term mosaic or we've heard tapestry, uh, but looking at these different portraits, imagine it really, I want you to, to walk away uh, with this book in hand, just viewing this gallery of possibilities for what adult Jewish learning can look like. Uh, and we've highlighted these because they're new and interesting and a little bit different, and they each tell us something about the possibility of what learning can look like. But these are just eight, and there are many more, and we all know the spaces. If we could put our own picture on the wall of the places that have inspired us, I'm sure we'd see even more. And so we look forward to hearing more of those from you. Thank you all for being here. We're delighted uh, that you're here and just uh, in closing, uh, I want to thank the Mandel Center for hosting this event, for hosting this project and promoting this project. Uh, and we look forward to sharing the recording with those who missed us today. Thanks everyone, it was a pleasure. Thank you.